Okay, welcome everyone to Systems Thinking Ontario. According to our log, this is Systems Thinking number 117. Um, my name is Zad Khan. I am co-organizing uh, Systems Thinking Ontario in 2024 with David Ng. Um, and I'm really excited to uh, welcome you all to the session today called What Can Systems Thinkers Learn From Educational Game Studies? Um, and so in typical systems thinking uh, Ontario fashion, what we'd like to do is just go around the small room that we have now, and hopefully some more folks trickle in from some of the tech uh, difficulties and just introduce ourselves um, specifically with respect to, you know, your interest to systems thinking, interest exposure or familiarity with it. Um, so I'll just go in sequence of who's on the screen. Um, so David Ng. Hi, David Ng, longtime System Thinking Ontario person, starting back in 2012. Thank you. Uh, Kelly Okamura. Uh, hi, Kelly Okamura. Uh, still learning systems. I don't know. <laughs> Been at Systems uh, system Thinking Ontario for a long time. Looking forward to this session. Uh, Peter Jones. have to unmute first. Hi, everyone. Um, I think I know most of the people here, but, uh, you know, you might, um, the news I have uh, for some is that um, I'll, I'll be starting as a professor in systemic design at Tecnologico de Monterrey in Mexico uh, in another week. And so this is my last week as a continuous resident uh, in Toronto. And from here on out over the next year, I'll be going back and forth. So this is an indication of the interest at the university level at Mexico's one of, one of Latin America's largest universities in introducing uh, the work of systems thinking and design uh, throughout uh, throughout design programs, but other uh, departments there. So uh, that's uh, that's happening now. So I'm just dropping in for a little bit tonight, and and thanks for for holding the sessions. Uh, Thank you, Peter, and warm wishes and best of luck on that, and keep us posted. Um, next on my screen is Salman. Hi, everyone. Um, Salman Abdeen here, uh, OCAD grad, uh, student of Peter's and David Ng, and friend of Zed's. Uh, still learning systems. I think I'll be learning for a long time. A long way to go. Still learning. Thank you. Uh, next is Emilio. Uh, hello, my name is Emilio Castillo. I am a, a current student at OCAD's SFI program, the Strategic Foresight Innovation Program. Uh, still learning uh, strategy as much as other folks are and uh, just interested to learn more, right? Thank you. Um, Prashant? Uh, hi, current student of OCAD SFI program as well. Um, got introduced to System Thinking Ontario by Peter Jones. Um, thank you for that. Yeah. Great. And uh, Megan? Hmm. Sorry, it took me a sec to find the mute button there. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Halstern. Um, I'm a human centered designer by background, but got exposed to uh, systems thinking during the Studio Y fellowship I did a few years ago. And I haven't attended any of these events before, but I love gaming and uh, serious games. And uh, Jeff and I have had some great chats about it. So I'm looking forward to the session. Awesome. That works as a nice transition into the, the topic. So I think on this session, we're going to try to chunk out the conversation. Um, I'll be moderating between myself and um, moderating this conversation between Scott and Jeff, um, who will introduce themselves shortly. But we'll kind of do it in like, and this is a small group here, so this works really well, just in kind of three chunks of conversations uh, with enough um, participant conversation from anyone else who wants to join in and ask questions and explore where the dialogue might go. So um, we have invited here Scott DeJong from Concordia University, as well as Jeff Hill, um, SFI alumni. Um, rather than doing an injustice to their introduction, Scott and then Jeff, why don't you both introduce yourselves and then we can kind of get into the conversation. Happy to. 
Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Scott DeYoung. I'm a PhD candidate at Concordia University in their Communication Studies program. Prior to that, I did my master's here at Concordia in Media Studies. And prior to that, I did my Bachelor's of Arts in Education in Ontario um, at Laurier University, where I trained to be a primary uh, school teacher. Um, I'm no longer a primary school teacher, as I just said. I consider myself an educator, a designer, and a researcher. Um, and what I look at in my research is how we can use games to talk about serious issues like dis information and media literacy and fake news. Um, but I do a lot of stuff with that that looks at simulation, systems design, and a bit of cybernetic stuff as well, which I think we'll be talking about today. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, Jeff? Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Jeff Evamy Hill. <clears throat> I'm getting over a cold, so might be a little grovelly for a bit, but uh, I am a, currently a um, senior policy advisor at the Ontario Ministry of Energy. Uh, but prior to that, and what led me to that position was a, uh, a master's of strategic foresight and innovation at OCAD University, where uh, Peter and, and David were, were both my uh, pr professors. Uh, Peter, Peter was the my supervisor for my master's uh, major research project, which was about um, basically persuasive games and economics. And uh, that interest in persuasive games and economics um, and, and the systems thinking therein has led me down a, a rabbit hole of integrating that with that strategic foresight, with that uh, energy research into a, into a career of, of, of using uh, serious games for, for, the, for the kind of research that I do. So I'm really glad to be here and in, in, in having this conversation with Scott and, and thanks for Jazid and, and David for, for putting this on. Awesome, thank you both for the introduction. Um, so I guess the first question is, you know, in, in the title of this event, what can systems thinking learn from educational game studies? And we can um, explore that a little bit. What are like, please Scott and Jeff, introduce us to the world of educational game studies or game studies and it's, uh, its re related fields and its origins as well. Like, wh what is this field? Where is it at? And how did it come to be? Do you want, do you want me to start, Jeff? Yeah, please start. Okay. Educational game studies. I mean, I like to call it a field. We can call it a field. Some people in academia might push against calling it a field because game studies alone is still fighting to be considered a field within academia. Um, if we want to talk about like its history or its origins, it's a bit messy, actually. A lot of people will say that it comes out of anthropology is where like earlier game studies work was being done, where you would have people looking at cultures and their histories and how games and play were a part of that. Um, but a lot of the work that I do when I talk about education and I talk about games as tools for learning, we actually see that sit in a lot of different disciplines because at the end of the day, a lot of researchers and scholars have talked about how do I make sense of what I'm doing to people outside of here? And one of the solutions or directions that they've found interesting in has been games. And so educational game studies for me and from what I've looked at comes from a lot of different uh, disciplines, specifically mostly in the social sciences and humanities, but we see it in the hard sciences and maths as well, where, you know, math learning games have been popular since, you know, the rise of computers and even before then um, as means to make sense of these concepts to audiences. And so there's no like pinpoint dates. I can give you some big names and speakers for people interested in looking at the history of game studies and the, the voices that come into the, the dialogue there. And a lot of them are situated in the 1900s, but we can go further back if we really want to. Um, and what I say game studies is, to answer the, the larger question, is it's an analysis of games and play and how they're being taken up. When we're talking from an educational standpoint, we can get into terms of learning and seriousness and activism and social impact. Um, and I situate myself in a much more in like the serious and social space because all those words have weight in academia. But at the end of the day, it's using games not just for fun and leisure, but also to try to make sense, comprehend, or discuss certain concepts and themes with its audience. Um, I think that's like my my snappy overview. I don't know if you want to add anything, Jeff, because I can definitely go into more detail on some things here. Yeah, I say, I, say, I, I really am interested in Zaid's con uh, uh, original qu question is like, so what what are the origins? Like what when when we talk about this, this big, this big, uh, like, I, I agree with you on, on, on the purposes of everything like that. But what are some examples of where 
where this really kind of split off from from pure um, fun, or has have there have there always been educational uh, components to to games going back to like Senate or chess or or everything like that uh, th thousands of years ago? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. And you point to it as you ask, like the long history that sits there, right? And a lot of people actually talk about that the seriousness of games is actually the longer standing dimension of it. We talk about play as something that's innate. And we can look at, you know, cultures and how they have played as a pastime and leisure time for a long period of time. But when we talk about games, which are like structured systems or structured tools for representing or talking about certain things, a lot of them have historically that we've been able to find and locate have been models or systems uh, for the systems thinkers in the room to try to understand certain things, right? So you mentioned Senate, um, which was a game that talked about um, early harvests and um, like seed placements uh, or like for, for farming. Um, we can also talk about chess, right? That's a very typical uh, answer when we talk about the history of game studies. And the work that I do and the work that I think a lot of you might be interested in when it comes to the system side comes from military operations, which were sitting, I think, in the, the 15, 1600s, where we saw wargaming kind of rise up, especially within Prussia, was like a big, a big wargaming space. But chess even shows that wargaming practices were longer than that. Um, and wargaming then eventually merged, and then a lot of big games game study stuff that we talk about today comes from like that that hit of computation when computers kind of hit the scene uh, in the the 40s 50s 60s we started to see one of the first things that they played on computers was a game they looked at using game like those systems to play games or make models that were game like um, and from there, first attempts were, we're going to take this very seriously. We have this new tech. We're going to design, you know, simulation tools. We're going to design these big mathematical models. And then you have others that are like, yeah, but we can also play Pong. Or we can also make Pac-Man uh, when we move into, like, farther arcade. And from there, you kind of see game studies start to latch on to different elements, where today we have those like myself who sit in the education standpoint, but others who focus on the more leisure commercial side of the, the field. I find that a fascinating inversion, Scott, of looking at the history of game studies as almost traditionally being systems modeling and war games and military origin and the play aspect of it being more of a, a novel mutation in a, in a way. Um, that's kind of a funny uh, inverted uh, perspective. Um, sorry, Jeff, I didn't want to cut you off. Were you, were you going to respond to Scott on something? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I you, 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 uh, suggested a different question for me actually, which is, uh, is play, like, are games playable systems? Games are playable systems in a, in a, in a sense, but what, but in that inversion that Zaid just said, like, what role, what, what is the role of play in, in understanding systems? And, and, in, and is there, is there more of an interpretation of play as in play as in, the ability to of movement of, of malleability, uh, not just in terms of play, in, in terms of leisure. leisure. Um, what role does play take in, in in helping us understand systems? Maybe is a question I had later 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 on. Um, a little bit, but maybe you want to We can jump into it now. Yeah, I love talking about play. I, I will say straight up, play is like my jam. This is what I actually spend a lot of my work talking about. My dissertation explores what happens if we think about disinformation as play, not as a system. Um, but I won't I won't bore you with the theory of that. For, I'll, I'll return to Jeff's actual question, which is where is the relationship between play and games and what, what do each have in, in regards to systems? And so very briefly separating the two terms, games as I try to understand them and conceive them, are structures or sets of rules or sets of systems that we have to act within. Typically, if we look at someone named uh, Bernard Suits, he talked about games as trying to achieve a particular goal, but inefficiently. But you're trying to do it as efficiently as possible inefficiently, um, right? So when you're playing uh, a game like Pac-Man, you're trying to collect all the dots, but like if you didn't have the rules of like where you can go and how you can move, you could just collect the dots very easily, right? Um, whereas play are the actual actions, the actual behaviors, the interactions that we as individuals have with either other individuals or with the game itself, right? Because we can play by ourselves and it's just us against the system, um, or we can play with those around us. And play scholars have talked about how play is more than just interacting with systems. It can also be like, uh, jumping out of an airplane and feeling that kind of um, experience of falling, that is a form of play. It's like a sensory act. Um, and not to get too in depth of all the minutia and how we can define play, 
coming back to the question, I think play is more important than games when we're talking about how systems function. Um, so, and I think that's where we can differentiate systems thinking from game studies thinking, which is where game studies will focus on the system, but how it's interacted with, whereas systems thinking, to my knowledge, and please correct me if I'm wrong, typically focuses on how we can make that system and what we can learn from mapping out that system and exploring the different branches, avenues, and networks that come up in doing so. Um, and that isn't to say that you don't look at how people engage in that system, um, but it's typically much more focused on the design side, whereas when I'm focusing on play, I'm looking at how myself as an individual comes to that game or how my students, if I'm a teacher, come to that game, what kind of knowledge they bring to that game and how their knowledge interacts with the system that's in the game. Because game studies, when I'm making educational games, I don't need them to be perfect. I don't need to do them to be accurate simulations. I need them to be close enough to create the conversation that while we're playing it, players are able to be like, oh, this doesn't actually match, or this does match, or this makes me think about X, Y, and Z. Um, and so play is that interaction that allows us to kind of further reflect on our own behaviors and actions and make decisions and outcomes from that, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I think, I think, Play is is a feature and not a bug of serious uh, games as, as systems, playable systems kind of thing. Like uh, even in a military context, which which as, as Scott rightly pointed out was one of the was one of the originators of, of why we have s this strain of serious games today. Military analysts are looking to in, in analog games at least model the model the basis of the system so that they can push out. The possibility space so that they can entertain unlikely outcomes um but based on kind of a system the, the, the uh, understanding of, of the of the basic system dynamics right as, as, as scott pointed out but it really is is a feature to 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 play to to exist in that space to push out the decision points to push out the options and and see how they see how they how they how they function i think I think that distinction, Scott and Jeff, that you mentioned that the difference between game studies and systems thinking and the focus on play and the interactions versus the focus on the systems modeling was really helpful and probably something we can unpack um, further. Um, just in the spirit of conversation, I noticed, Scott, there was something you said about when you were speaking about the origins of the field or not field for now. Um, you references touch points related to social sciences and the anthropology and I know Peter Jones uh, here picked up on that. And maybe I'll just pass it over to Peter if you wanna share your comment or because or, I picked up on that uh, thread as well. Um, and then if Salman, you're around, we can get in some of your comments as well. Oh, thanks, Ad. Um, I didn't have uh, too much to add other than that reference because I think the direction of the discussion is, is not going towards the kind of, um, uh, distributed cognition in in and how people actually you know play as an activity and how that forms the system, which is the more the activity theory basis um, in anthropology. So my reference to that uh, was kind of back when we were talking about the different you know uh, foundational schools that are that historically have led to different uh, uh, systems views of of gameplay. And, and one of them is in Vygotskyan activity theory. So it is a process in, in Bonnie Nardi's work. Um, so this is part of, a part of her understanding of different uh, models of learning in, in the Vygotsky uh, activity sense and how, uh, and how uh, people collaborate to learn through types through play, but that is you know as, a, as something that, creates an activity system that is a, a kind of a social system or a network that enables uh, learning processes um, as the as the actual outcome even even if the game itself seems to be the point like with her, her work in multi-user dungeons whether muds as they were called back in the late 90s mm -hmm. So that's that was just a, a reference back into one of the other kind of anthropological uh, you know, um, influences in uh, you know from a systems perspective into in, into uh, game studies, but I think it's evolved into really a you know a, a different approach now. Yeah, I mean Bonnie Nardi's work, if I remember correctly, I think 
um, if you Google her or you look at her work, like she did like an ethnographic or like you can see actually see her like role play characters if you like look her up because it's it's really fascinating for those who, are, who I haven't spent a ton of time. I've looked more at Celia Pierce, who's done related but not the same. Celia Pierce spent a lot of time like as a character, and she's given talks as her like wow character in in uh, presentations, which is fascinating to me. Where they look at kind of how these social and cultural systems that we have in real life blend into these games as well, but then they create new meanings and new new systems and new actions through that. And I think it's really really fascinating and cool. So um, Salma, did you have any first impressions of, of, of the topic that you want to share? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to, um, add on to what Peter was, uh, getting at about anthropology and the link. Um, my thought is that, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, Jungian psychology, which is currently discredited, but which, uh, works a lot inside role-playing games and whether you accept that the Jungian archetypes still have weight in real life. They definitely have weight in role-playing games. And if you look at um, the way that archetypes are used in character building inside games, um, the parallels are insane. It's games are real life. There, there is actually on a meta level, no distinction between a game and the simulation in which we operate in our lives. Um, if you believe we live in a simulation. The point is that the, it's a philosophical construct, right? Uh, so it all depends on how much agency you want to give to the characters within a constraint. Sounds like life to me. I, I fail at times to see the difference between a character inside a big multiplayer game and my life. What's the difference? It's pretty much I have certain amount of agency and then there are rigid systems around me that I have to operate in and navigate. It's, it's exactly like playing a game. So the parallels um, from anthropology to archetypes to um, uh, role-playing games to Dungeons and Dragons to real life, it's a very interesting circle. And I was just looking back at uh, Bruno Latour's work, uh, the ANT framework. Uh, mm -hmm. Not many people like to look at Latour anymore, but I think he's brilliant. I think it it really operates in that liminal space between um, philosophy, psychology, and games and systems. It, you know, his work kind of goes on and off between all these spaces. I see David nodding because he agrees with me with that. All right, that's all I had to say. Thanks. Scott, Jeff, anything on the philosophy that Salman opened up about? Does does this meta conversation ever come up in your in the both of your works and how it relates to people's own experiences in reality? Do you want to go first, Jeff? I feel like I've been taking the mic a lot. No, I'd be interested to hear what you what you say on this. Okay, so one of the first. Um, moments that I can always relate back to in my my graduate studies was when I started trying to define what play in games means because you know every grad student tries to get their definitions down as they go into writing and I had an existential crisis because I determined that everything in life was games and everything in life was play and I couldn't differentiate anything and I mean hearing you talk about you know the simulation I know you're you're talking much more on, on a high eye level about it reminds me of that um that conversation and I think Player types, and I, I don't know a ton about Jungian psychology, so I don't want to like at all start to speak to that as I'm an expert, but the, the idea of like archetypes and player types gets talked a lot about in games. And Latour does come up in some game studies texts that talk about actor network theory as a way to kind of understand uh, people and systems. Um, and I think player types, actor types, they're helpful. And I, they're one of the ways that I differentiate games and game design from players and player intentions. Because a lot of the times you'll see games and game designers make like particular roles. Like you have your support class, your tank class, your assassins. They have particular um, dimensions that you're supposed to play their game within. But then players will pick up those roles and play them completely differently, right? You have meta breaking or meta defining or alternate ways of doing so. And obviously players that break those systems are rarer than those who follow the system. Um, but one of the most common examples you'll hear people talk about is someone who played the pacifist run of World of Warcraft, who just spent the entire time in the starting zone picking flowers, because I think you get like 5 XP per flower, and eventually they got to max level picking flowers, and it took them forever. Um, 
but it's it's one of those reminders to me that yes we have these like preconceived kind of expectations of behavior and preconceived notions that we can drive into games but players always differentiate the two and so when i in my work have tried to settle the difference between games play in my own reality i think they are frameworks so games and player frameworks we can apply onto a reality to have better understandings of what's going on and i think that's where simulations and system studies gets really helpful but at the end of the day there's still a break between how we've structured kind of the boundaries of of allotment of acceptability and how we actually interact with those systems. And so I, I coming back to that comment I made about suits, that idea of like designing rules for the inef like efficient inefficiency um, is a really nice way to think about like we've created a system to play in and it's not perfect because if we're playing like a system or simulation in like a boardroom, if I'm doing like a matrix game with dice, we could always just stop rolling dice and say this happens and the game is over and move on. But we choose to engage because we've all accepted the boundaries and rules for that. And there are relationships to society and how culture structures us through rules, right? And I think a conversation on rules is really interesting and fascinating. And if you're interested in that conversation, there's a scholar um, called Jakob Stenros uh, in um, Denmark. Um, I'm pretty I'm like 95% sure now I'm dead. He might be finished. He's finished. He's finished. He's not dead. He's not dead. He's finished. Who's writing an entire book about how rules are written and rules are formed and how they transcend more than just games and play. And I think that's a really fascinating conversation to have that. And once we start pulling back these layers, we start to get to that disciplinary kind of soup that I started kind of talking about where like to situate game studies, you see all these different kind of fields and discussions and ideologies and say, uh, talking about these things. And that's why game studies is a hard time carving out its niche as a field and discipline today. Um, I think I kind of went on a tangent from your question and comment, but it's a fascinating comment. And I agree with you that Latour could use some more conversation in game studies and just in general. But I think he's coming back. Like I see after network theory come up a lot more in journal articles these days, but maybe I'm crazy. T taking it a bit a bit kind of same but different direction i mean my research with, with peter was on uh, this idea from ian bogost of uh procedural rhetoric or basically the art of persuasion through through kind of rule-based processes and interaction rather than spoken or written word and kind of quoting that a little bit um but essentially it's, it's like can 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 processes be pers persuasive and can they and they and can they influence your actions? Can they influence your thoughts? This kind of thing. My research was about um, games like SimCity, and 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 if they basically would, if on the premise that they could influence your 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 thoughts about how city planning, how economics might work, then how could we design games to to put less less of an emphasis on on continuous unending growth, on on the pollution as a as an endless sink and these kinds of things. How could we build a systemic ecological understanding to these games that might be persuasive in a different way? So it's really one of the interesting things that I've I've come across or, or people have people have commented on that is well, if if games like SimCity can shape your mindset about 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 ecological economics or economics or whatever, then was was Hillary Clinton right about Grand Theft Auto in the in the early two thousands or whoever was was criticizing Grand Theft Auto that if you play Grand Theft Auto, uh, mm -hmm. you are going to become a criminal or you are going to become more violent and and I, I think it's interesting to me, you know, on one hand or the other, and I'd be really interested to hear what Scott has to say about this. What kind of what kind of learning is it? through games that 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 allows you to maybe this have this con kind of conceptual learning but maybe action in these ways like how how is this explained in the in, lit in the literature in 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 what you've encountered yeah i mean learning in games is like a hot topic that's weirdly been a hot topic for a while but for some reason people always get excited when i talk about games as learning tools or they talk they get really excited when you talk about games as being a means to communicate something to an audience and I have a lot of qualms with how a lot of people perceive learning in games, um, to put it simply. I think a lot of the time I'll go into talks or meetings with people and they'll think that games are be all end all learning tools. They, you, they're they kind of like a hypodermic needle, like a vaccine or a solution for dealing with a problem where you just play a game and, and it's worked away. In practice, we also see a lot of teachers or educators using games as kind of 
similar to um, what sometimes happens with books where like, instead of reading critically or playing critically, it's like, oh, you finished the thing we're supposed to do right now, go play a game for five minutes and then we'll, we'll move on uh, next time, right? And we see those kind of perspectives offload into how games become designed. Um, and especially in the educational learning space, I found that a lot of actors who are making these games are individuals who are more familiar from the educational side and less from the design side. And because of that, a lot of their games try to make the game and the play a teacher and not an interaction. Um, and what I mean from that is you have these, these games that are extremely procedural. They're, they're extremely direct. They're extremely binary in how they function, where you go into the game and you don't have a lot of choice. You don't have a lot of agency. You don't have a lot of say. It's practically just like maybe a quiz even, or it's just a, a narrative adventure game where your choices don't really matter um, because they're so worried or they're so concerned with their audience learning a certain way. I call those games rote games, and I also call those games, for the most part, uh, boring or not even really games. Um, but they they fit into that space, and they're important for certain types of exercises. For like, let's say we want to teach children mathematics, and we just want them to understand the basics of how like the equations function and what the symbols mean. Sure, rote is great there. But when we're talking about like larger complex systems, when we're talking about larger cultural issues. Um, wrote kind of games, those kind of styles for learning are ineffective at actually getting to the questions that we want to get at. Um, similar to how when you're mapping out a system, you're thinking and you're finding new dimensions for thinking about how it interplays with the worlds and structures around it. Playing a game that allows you agency to reflect on how you're playing that game can be really, really powerful for learning. I talk a lot about how games are tools um, for facilitation, reflexis reflexivity, and um, self-awareness. Um, where when I make games uh, and I work using games with students to talk about issues like disinformation, we're I, there's no answers there. And you're allowed to fail. Um, because when we're failing, when we're looking for the holes, the problems, when there's not clarity on every single aspect we're taking, we as players or learners who are playing those games have a chance to reflect on why did they lose or why are they confused or what are they coming against that's that's causing them to have choices and challenges. And that's where I think when we talk about learning spaces and knowledge spaces, the most kind of practical, usable, and retainable pieces actually come up because those are the moments that we'll reflect on, the, the moments that we'll have to critically evaluate, and they're the moments that kind of stick with players as they move forward. I remind my students a lot that like most people can't remember the day that they remembered how to read. Um, we just eventually were able to connect how sounds and letters together produced certain senses of meaning, and from there we, we grew to understand you know, comprehension. And the same is true for a lot of how we understand these larger issues and systems is that there's so many parts that we have to first get a handle on that every single time we interact with them in ways that allow us to reflect and think a little bit, the more we get a hold of what's going on. Very, very interesting. I think Great. that that part you mentioned about arriving at questions, I guess overall is a sentiment there that is, is so critical and the fact that it has like a reflection embedded in it. Cause I think traditionally, maybe in a popular culture sense, you might think as games as definitive, affirmative, conclusive versus Scott, what you're describing as something that's much more reflective and gets you to invites more questions than perhaps it answers. Um, Jeff, you were gonna, you were gonna comment on the latest. No, I just think that's that's wonderful. I mean, Scott and I have had different conversations over the over the last few years, and it's uh, it's amazing to see, uh, to hear and see how how you how you conceptualize this. Uh, I mean, I'd be curious, like, to to move into an opportunity for you to tell us about your 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 journey, especially in in how in the context of how you've you've been able to 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 think about simulation, to think about um to think about models to think about play and learning through the lens of disinformation because i think that's a real that's a really interesting thing that that would be nice to get to at least a little bit um through that so 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 so, so tell us a little bit about how that how think, that evolved maybe, maybe just before before because we, we're yeah then we'll jump into like this specific disinformation but one 
And before we do that, one curious question I had, maybe just in terms of interaction for those, for others on the call, because Scott, you, you presented an interesting framing of games. And I just wondered, uh, does anyone on the call have experiences with this format of games that inspire reflection, curiosity, questions, um, self-reflection? Um, I don't know if anyone has any experiences uh, with that that they want to share or any impressions of what's being described here so far. I had dropped in uh, a few links and I'm, I'm putting two and two together now that we're having these discussions um, because I've been talking to um, uh, people in the in the um, Fernando Flores space. And so I'm now seeing the long arc, which was um, Fernando Flores wrote a book called uh, Disclosing New Worlds. So we're coming from Heidegger. And the question is, you know, how do you actually make a breakthrough uh, when it becomes permanent? And um, I now understand his long-term dissatisfaction that um, that people didn't really understand the book. And thinking in terms of leadership, how do you get people to make the big jumps uh, and perceive? Um, so he had done some work in uh, pluralistic networks where uh, he had, um, uh, in effect, a 75-year-old partner of his, uh, Chauncey Bell, playing games, you know, Counter-Strike, whatever, uh, in um, like for hours and hours, like eight hours a day sort of stuff on an extended period of time. And he was trying to figure out how you how the group self-organize and people take on roles when they're not structured. Um, because uh, if leadership is not about, you know, one person asserting the leader to position, then how is it self-organized around that? And so um, now I've actually come around to this um, on his Pluralistic Networks uh, page. They have a, a mood navigator. And now I understand what they're asking about when they say, oh, doing research into moods, which is in effect not only the individual getting that disclosing, but the idea that a, a small group might be able to learn together and make a, a change in the world. I think um, Kelly also uh, had her hand up and maybe wanted to add some of her impressions and takeaways from the, and Kelly, I, Kelly, did you want to share anything? I, I, I mean, I, share, I shared a couple in, in, in the chat in terms of uh, uh, games. Uh, I think that the empathy toy was a really interesting uh, entry because it it allowed um, people to step into s someone else's shoes. It was uh, something that uh, I dropped a link in, into there, but I've I've uh, um, you know I I thought because it was a toy that it was didn't relate to me and uh, where the the state that my kids were at. But once I understood uh, the value of what the toy offered in terms of the game playing. You had two players playing, but also the observers who were able to see th uh, the the challenge. So the the game expanded beyond two in terms of trying to work out um, having an empathy for another person's situation that was not theirs. Yeah, that was a big. That was a big. Um, that one got a lot of. Uh publicity in that one yeah that one was quite well known um yeah scott were you were you were about to say something yeah i mean the the conversation on empathy like games as tools for discussing empathy is like a really fascinating piece and also a point that a lot of designers have talked written about in terms of how do we balance this in a way that doesn't also become like problematic or concerning right because when you're putting people in other people's shoes there's always a chance that that goes the wrong way um i'm not overly familiar with the empathy toy so i can't speak to like the product's success and in, in its engagement but i can speak to kind of the points that you were making there which is kind of the value of that interactive piece and i think for me that's why I situate a lot of my work in the analog, in the physical, and in the cooperative. Um, one of the, the readings that I shared, if, if people ever had a chance to check them out or after are interested in looking at, um, was about um, the work of model cities. Um, Jen Light uh, wrote the piece, and it was looking at kind of a program in the 60s and 70s that one of the core dimensions of what they were doing, they were simulating kind of um, social systems within cities and the challenges that were going on there. And one of the, the core dimensions was cooperation. Because they're like, when we are trying to understand and may have people understand what's going on with X problem or X issue in this in this larger structure, we need them to be 
talking. We need them to be collaborating. We need them to be in some capacity engaging with each other. And based off my, I was I was kind of watching, like skimming through a video and reading a quick thing on the empathy talk. It seems to be doing something very similar with how you have to engage with the product. There, there's, it seems to be a need for at least one other person to be there. Um, the tools, but just a device to talk about the larger things that they want people to talk about, right? The idea that we're thinking about how other people are interacting with it thinking about how other people are understanding what's even happening. The 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 um the toy is just kind of a device to get them to the goals of what empathy is about, which is thinking about how other people engage with spaces around them and being recognized recognized recognizing that. Um mm -hmm. and so I think that's a really good example, as you're saying, to the benefits that games can provide, because it's not like it's a perfect simulation of empathy, but it's a good practice and activity that then can help us reflect on what empathy means and how we can apply that in our everyday life yeah if, if i could just make a quick comment uh with regards to the En-ROADS that i also dropped uh the participation the the, the game at uh climate interactive actually came out of um and Rhodes understanding that they could have as much science and as much knowledge as, as they had, but if, pe if they couldn't engage people into it, uh, what's fun about the game is, is you can have a climate justice warrior and put them into the role of a, an oil baron. They've got to defend the position and they have to work together. So the game is, it's been played at the UN, it's been played by Obama's uh, administration for them to understand the complexity in terms of like what we were looking at for uh, climate change and how is it that we're going to, <laughs> I, I guess we bypassed the 1.5, um, but how is it that we're gonna get there? Uh, I've, I've done it in my building, my, uh, my condominium building because people were, how can we actually make the change as individuals? I think there's a lot of opportunity for uh, for them to step into these shoes. But what I liked the most was was uh, the dress up aspect of it. They just got to dress up like um, the Secretary General of the UN or <laughs> one of these people. You sort of just you know had to get out of your own headspace and into another's. Yeah, I think role play is like a really powerful tool just to get people involved. It's one of the tactics that I've actually used in games. I've I've made an escape room about older adult mistreatment or elder abuse is another term for it. And there was a lot of over the pandemic, you can't run an escape room, which is when the project was supposed to occur. And so we actually augmented it into other kind of role play scenarios like murder mysteries and stuff like that. And it was a really interesting way to kind of engage people in it. Uh, the En-ROADS games, just if we're going to talk about that briefly, reminds me a lot of the world game. And I don't know if you're familiar of the world game, which is Buckminster Fuller and we're going back a, a few a few decades now uh, to the world game but it still exists today there's someone named Medard Gable who worked with Buckminster who's still running workshops and I did one in 2021 with them I sat in on it and I've interviewed him for a project that I'm working well a colleague was working on and I just helped out with one of the chapters for their book um which is looking at kind of the world game in this larger understanding of how systems thinking and systems games thinking is tied to computer history. And I, if you're interested in that, I can tell you who, who the guy writing the book is and I, all that info. But the world game is so fascinating because in talking to Medard Gable, who I mentioned before, worked on that project, about it, it was a lot of similar themes to what you were just mentioning, where people are put in shoes that they're not typically, it might even be opposite to who they are. There's a lot of need for collaboration, but most critically was the visualization of it. One of the earlier runs of the world game they did, they actually, I think it was in Japan, they got a high school gym and they filled the entire floor with a map of the world. Like they printed out this massive, massive map. And this was in the Cold War. And one of the things that they did is they brought out chips to represent the amount of nuclear weapons that were being made like just like little tiny circles and they started putting them on the map in all the places that the, they were being stock held and they said the silence in the room as players had to go and put the amount of nuclear weapons that their country had during this cold war time where it, it's even on everyone's minds right the the efficacy and danger of these things when they're doing that and the, the play pattern was very simple like the game was not complex right it's like this is you're just supposed to show the, the data um the by visualizing it and seeing it, the room was like in pure silence and stunned uh, as they described it to us. And then eventually what people ended up doing is they started 
removing the pieces from the game, which wasn't in the rules. They weren't supposed to do it. People were like, we don't want to see this. We don't like it. And so they started removing it. And that act of kind of transgression is also one of those points where it's talking about like, you expect players to act a certain way, behave a certain way, but sometimes they push against it. And that's a key point for learning and talking about, okay, so you want to remove these things. How can we actually do that? Like, what are the steps we can take as a collective to do that, right? And I think that that speaks really well to what you were saying. And it's a really powerful story that I've always kind of sat in. I think, I think a lot of these comments, you know, really emphasize like things like empathy and role playing and, and experiential learning really emphasize some of the threads um, that are contained in this. And I know from my own experience, I think, Peter, if you're still there, I think Peter even as a student, uh, you had us play a simulation. I can't remember the name of that game, but it had a lot of those um, system dynamics and and aspects of like, you know, essentially delays were the big feature of that game where you would you would choose to make an action and the, its effects would come out many moves later. And I think that was like one of the main points I recall in that. Oh yeah, that, that was a uh, echo policy, which was uh, developed by uh, Frederick uh, Vester and used in Austria, um, almost like as a world game process. Um, in Austria and Germany, they um, had had competitions between, you know, high schools and other schools that that where they would learn to use this system you know, the systems principle, system dynamics simulation of different um, very simple points, points-based loads on interventions, and things like, and, and you, had, you could uh, change within, you know, you're trying to improve the outcomes of, of a city or a region, and you have just, uh, you know, four variables that you can uh, adjust and between you know, uh, making decisions that are based on the values of the participants um, and then looking at the types of outcomes that they would want, trying to gain that system, it would usually fail. And and that's the the counterintuitive thing about, um, you know, that you, that you would find based on the delays and on the differences between the different um, uh, patterns uh, patterns of, of influence um, between, for example, um, say sanitation and industrial production, uh, cultural development and education. You know, so it's so all, all you, you know, students would come in with this kind of idealistic idea that if we improve education and and put a lot of money into kind of, you know, cultural activities as well. And that was usually where the argument is. And then it would blow up in two years. <laughs> You know, so because it would it would reinforce some of the wrong things, and it would interact. But those variables would be hidden. That was different than like in the Buckminster Fuller World game, where the interactions between the the players themselves are creating the understanding. And within Echo Policy, there is you know there are real algorithms that are based on research that are used you know, in, as, as underlying uh, variables. And that can be, that can be learned and understood that are still difficult to use in, in decision-making. Yeah. Speaking of hidden information and information, so maybe Jeff, now let's rewind the tape a few minutes and why don't you maybe repeat or rebridge us to the question you want to ask Scott. Yeah, so so Scott, like with with all the all, with all this consideration, I mean, I actually had a bit of a follow up question or a comment before that, which is an interesting thing about role play has been, as was pointed out, when you're playing with somebody in 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 different shoes, right, and and often in an adversarial context. So the so the so the uh, climate hawk playing the oil company. Oftentimes, you can you can identify really interesting insights or or strategies or or or, or empathetic uh, you know again again insights from from that from that result. I think where a real question comes in um, for me and even in my work is is who gets to be represented by by whom and 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 how do they have to do justice or 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 is it appropriate for uh, like for instance, a, a non-indigenous person to to play the role of an indigenous person, or or some other combination. Like I know in the En-ROAD simulation, and, I, and this is an very obvious one to me. 
there is a disclaimer b- beforehand that um, you know it's very important for for no cultural stereotyping, especially in terms of head headwear and things like that, to to take place. So uh, you know that that's more extreme. But even 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 you know when we talk about role play, I think it is really relevant to a systems to, to a systems dialogue. To say you know, who who how do, how do we uh, work with work under those uh, you know, considerations. Um, yeah, Scott. That's a, a really pertinent question. And I think it's one that a lot of people are still talking about and even wrestling with what are the lines there? Because I think and my, my short answer for that is it depends and it's case specific, but the long answer for why I'm saying something that kind of, which seems like a cop-out answer, um, is that role play is extremely a powerful tool. And because it's extremely powerful, it's also can be quite dangerous if it's not used correctly. Um, One of the things that I have concerns with when we think about learning games is you have those who are making learning games for a very particular audience in mind. So they're designing their learning game for say their local community or their local set of students. And there you can think about role play slightly differently than if you're making a game that's meant for everyone. Um, Because as we, are all probably aware now basic media theory tells us that when you make a product or you make a, a tool and you give it to a general audience everyone's going to interpret it gener- differently you're going to have some people who are going to interpret it as was designed and you're going to have people who are going to interpret it the other way around it's why every single thing has a debate and there's always there's always kind of polar opposite dynamics there um the answer that I see come up the most often by other experts and in the literature is you want to bring matter subject experts to the table if you're going to do role play, right? So if you're going to have a game that's going to potentially ask players to participate as vulnerable populations, that you want to bring experts on how those vulnerable populations um, should be represented. So you'd want to bring people from their communities to the game. However, that doesn't always work. Um, At the start of this, there was an image from Oregon Trail, which is a classic educational game about traveling uh, and settling across America. And it's considered a big successful hit and we don't need to get into the game. But I don't know if any of you are familiar that Oregon Trail, the company that made them, actually had another game that talked about the um, railroad when it came to slavery in the United States. And that game, they had subject matter experts um, from Black communities come and give perspectives on that game. It was a total disaster. It came out. It was completely shut down. It was designed for a general audience. And people were completely offended by how the game portrayed the, the Black community and, and other historical factors in the game. And so that was where they had the team of experts, but it didn't fully go right because there were still larger factors that when you brought it to a general broader audience didn't work out. Um, and so when we talk about role play and we talk about role playing when we're in sensitive issues, I think it's really powerful, but I think it's meant for smaller audiences. Like I don't really want to see products that claim to, you know, for a general audience, give everyone the experience of X community, because that's going to make me really nervous, because even within those communities, they're not one singular experience. One of the things that I think today gets lost in the weeds, especially when I'm talking to people about fake news, is that communities and bodies and individuals get put into singularities all the time. We get put into kind of a homogeneic Uh, identities and all of us know that that's vastly different right um like every community that we're a part of there are tons of different people in them that range in how they engage with the ideals and ideas of that community and even in the conversation tonight if we think about like the academics that have been brought up all of them have contested communities of thought around them um that when we're engaging in these questions of like role play and serious issues, it's really important to recognize who your audience is for. And in my opinion, keep it on the smaller scale. If you're going to scale something up, you probably want to tone down the level of severity that some of your issues that are getting into or the level of role play that's allowed, depending on what themes you're engaging in. Um, But those are larger questions that designers are still grappling with because it's important that we have representation in games. It's just how do we do that effectively? Um, which I think is also a sub question to your larger question that you asked. And Prashant raises, I'll let you chat in a second, Prashant, but th- this idea of kind of like a uh, reflection and debrief is like, that's that's the other thing that, that just just tie things up. Debrief and reflection is is a key key part. Like if it, if, you, if you haven't done that part of, of, of a game of a serious learning game, then you you haven't you haven't done it. So, uh, so yeah, 
Um, Zed, did you did you, did you, wanna, you wanna do you wanna bring Prashant? Do you wanna speak to your point because I think it's really well expressed as a as a TA um, for the game design. Uh yeah sure. Um, so it was just from the perspective of like how immersing yourself in the games and learning about it, right? So it was just a branch of thought from there about, um, or rather a reflection from my own side because I work as a TA, um, in terms of how do we, um, uh, create the assignments as well, um, for the particular course, which is intro to game design. And, um, uh, if there is any learning points that we do. So it's more of a reflection from my own perspective about the assignments of how they reflect on the games itself. And yeah, one of the assignments that we uh, asked the students to do is a live action RPG, very much like sort of Dungeons and Dragons, um, which also brings me to the point of like how they, uh, how they create a notion or uh, the role play being powerful, right? Because when D&D &D was at its peak, um, all the Christians said that it's a game for demons <laughs> or you will, you would become satanic while playing it. Um, but it, in real, it was just like kids having fun and immersing themselves into the fantasy world. So, RPGs are very much like that, not the video game RPGs, but rather the ones that are played in real life because you actually try to understand the character that is there or rather um, understand the plot that is in there. And you may or may not enact uh, accordingly or you may have some ill intentions to break the plot as well. And then the game master actually tries to uh, set the boundary or the... Uh, limitations as to like what you can do or cannot do um very much like a system so it's just more of like yeah talking to myself and typing it out no i think that's a really really great point i mean i i'm a big fan of reflection and i actually think it complements what i was just saying really well where like if you're going to try to make a serious game that talks about like empathy and putting other people in people's shoes or representation really make sure that you're having a good reflection and facilitation for something like that. I think like when I was saying like, don't have it rolled out for the general audience, it don't have it rolled out without effective tools to break down what's happening and the roles you're playing is the caveat that I should have said. And that's a great point. And I think RPGs are, I, I mean, I play a ton of like D and D style systems. I play a ton of role-playing games. I've we're done some work with like LARPing communities and LARP design, which is live action role play for those who are unfamiliar. And there's a lot of, a lot of value that comes in that. And I don't know how familiar everyone here is with LARPing, which is the the people who you, they're, they're memed for, they show up at parks on a Sunday with swords and chain mail and they hit each other. Uh, but it's much more than that. Um, that's that's the LARP that we know here in America, in both North, like in, in the US and Canada. But there's LARPing communities in um, the Nordic countries that actually do very, very intensive, serious LARPs that if you're fascinated in the space, like they will do LARPs that talk about like being a woman in the newsroom. Um, and that's like the LARP, um, which is like wild and crazy. And it's super, super interesting. But one of the things they talk about when they're doing role play on these really like serious, I, I think um, I was talking with someone who did a LARP that was, they LARPed um, gay conversion therapy. So some people were like the, like, LARPed as queer people going through conversion therapy and other people were like the enactors of it and it was like a very dark and gritty LARP and it's really really powerful and everyone's signing up they they know ahead of time what they're signing up for no one's caught off guard but still it's a very intensive and emotional experience especially if some of them going there have that trauma in their lives already and one of the things they talked about um, is this notion of bleed that comes up in LARP which is that while we're role playing, there's still parts of ourselves that kind of come out in the character. And also when it's done, how do I shift back from this this hard, intensive role play time back to myself? And they have like set time at the end of every LARP to just debrief and mourn the character that you played and reflect on the character you played and talk about who you played and what happened to them and move on back into the life that you're in. And it's really, really an important step to take, especially when we're talking about like those serious ones, like that that very dark one that I mentioned. I think, yeah, the, the value of reflection is 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 super critical and important and runs through the entire conversation. Um, I'm just adjusting maybe where we're going the discussion on the fly. I, I really like 
uh, what Griff has has posted. So Griff, um, if you're available, if you're able to, why don't you maybe bring that to the conversation for for Scott and Jeff? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious uh, what the group's thoughts are on the dynamics of like reward seeking um, uh, and maybe even like open world exploration and the difference between those, those things uh, as well as grinding or um, yeah. And then, and, and a far, uh, far example, that would be addiction. So that's, that's one question. Uh, and then the second question is, do you ever get this sense? I've often had this. I play a lot of games. <laughs> uh, early, um, that early games, uh, early stage game of a game is much more fun than um, a late stage. When you're when you're at the early stage of a game, um, everything is vital. You're always sort of like on the precipice of death. Like there's a ton of novelty to all of these experiences. And in many games, by the time you're at mid or end game. Uh, of the process, um, it kind of just feels like you're managing uh, a bunch of stuff. You just have a bunch of assets that need to be managed. You're dropping inventory. You're having to make decisions. It's like your your role changes, and um, yeah, and then and then the relationship of that feeling to the grinding. Sometimes you grind to try to get to that late stage, and then you you miss the song and dance along the way. Would be the the Alan Watts, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, Brian, Jeff, do you want to jump in here? Sure, grinding, I'll jump. Oh, go ahead. Grinding for the audience, just to explain that, Griff, is 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 about uh, pursuing the point system or accumulation, right? That's what you refer to as grinding. Yeah, that's right. So, usually um, in a game, there will be like certain objectives that give you um perhaps like lopsided rewards or have like some sort of a like a long tail to them where you're trying to yeah accumulate points and so you might end up repeating the same action uh, multiple times to get that that um that reward and continue to do it so some characters like uh the flower picking i think could be sort of an example of grinding a sort of an interesting asymmetrical example but um but interesting yeah the flower picking and in, in wow so it's a type of grind yeah thank you yeah i just wanted to give some definitional context for for in case those terms were not familiar but yeah jeff jeff or scott yeah i don't have much to say about the the reward seeking grinding addiction but um the the late game early game like i think it's a great point and i think i mean you've already said it i mean the, the early game is filled the early game of any type of game is filled with with the with the greatest set of possibilities, it seems now. The 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 game that I think runs contrary to that, or at least or at least plays that up the most, is a game like um, Oath. It's a board game uh, by Cole Worley, and the basic premise of this game, without getting into it too much, is it's, it's kind of a, a war game of of fantasy, generic fantasy across the board. But the basic premise of the game is that the end state of of one game is the beginning state of the next. And, and that doesn't sound too, too earth shattering, but it, it really means that, that you do play through to the end. You, we would play through the end because constantly you're creating, you're creating a, a new legacy. So I think part of the, part of the, part of the way that, again, uh, I'm not getting into too, too much detail, but part of the way we've gotten around um, end game is to create that, that kind of meta, that meta game of, of of a legacy component where the 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 end feeds into a new beginning and and the cycle continues in, in some kind of ways. And the games that have been really successful in that, where choices matter towards the end of the game, like if your game of civilization, uh, Scott, uh, fed into the next game in some way, I mean, it, it kind of changes the role. But I agree, I, I'd be really interested to hear Scott why why you why you feel that, and of course on grinding uh, as well. Yeah, I'll start with. What you were talking about, and then I'll jump back to the reward seeking grinding piece. Um, I mean, I, it's also important to recognize like player types here. There are some people that love to like get to the end of these games where there's a thousand options and they can sit through them. And it's also important to recognize that some get there's a lot of variance in the type of games that are out there. Like for me as a player, sometimes the early game of a really complex game is actually really boring because like your turns are the same thing. You're just accumulating, you're in that grinding where you're just accumulating resources. You can finally get to the thing that you're supposed to do and then you do it and then it's really cool and fun. Um, and there's other games that that grinding space or that, um, that early game 
and then the late game, they're actually like two different games. Like there's there's actually so if you ever played like the game like Lost Ark, um, which is an MMORPG, it's a video game. Um the early games and WoW is actually kind of like this too, where like the early game of those games, like the main core of that game where you're getting from level one to level fifty or whatever, um, is kind of a lot of the same. But if you like that a lot of the same, like it's kind of fine, like you're going through quest lines, you're maybe doing some grinding, like where you're killing a bunch of monsters, um, here and there. But then when you get to the late game and you start like playing through raids with your team it's like the the start of the game is completely different than the end of the game and it's like what happened here and depending on what kind of player you are like for me i actually preferred the early game of wow to the late i didn't like raiding with people partially because i was really bad at it but also like also because it was a different style of game and lost ark was actually even worse for it because it became really expensive and i did not have the budget to do it um a game that i think is like a game that starts at the end game at the beginning is like Democracy 4, um, which if uh, some of you probably have heard of before, since a lot of simulations, people that I know really seem to like it and systems design people seem to really like it. It's an attempt to model a democratic system. And it's honestly, I've heard it described as an interactive spreadsheet. Like you open the game and it's just a thousand bubbles, not a thousand, like 50 bubbles. And they're all for different parts of a world system. Yeah, thank you for sharing it. And you start at the end game. And so like, if you want to ever get there you can because i think the other factor why people don't like end games is fatigue like that's my thing with civ i've like i've played this faction for now eight hours i'm kind of done i know it's gonna end like i i can already see the end result and therefore i don't need to play this out because it's just like grinding through turns to your i've been mentioning grinding i've been mentioning reward seeking i think grinding can be fun if that's something that like you want to do. I actually think grinding is a really good tool to reinforce a particular behavior. Um, so grinding, because you, you're forced to do the same thing over and over again, is a, is a nice way if you're a designer to get your players to learn to do the basics of a system. That's why a lot of early levels of games are kind of the same thing over and over again. They're not going to always call it grinding, but it's so you can understand the basic mechanics of a game so that if you get to the higher levels, you're not completely lost in what's happening there. Grinding becomes annoying for me when I can't go any further. I understand what I'm supposed to do, but I can't go any further until I reach X level because then I'm like, now I just have to keep doing this thing that I've already done and it's exhausting. Reward seeking... I'm going to bring it back to kind of the conversation on learning and educational games. I think it's a lot of the time can be sometimes a helpful tool, but other times it's a cop out in design where we're like, we want to make a game because we want, you know, people to learn some things. So if every time you answer a question, right, we're going to give you a point. And I, I find that that's really lazy design. If we're designing kind of games and models that are like, Hey, every time you answer this question, you get a point. Every time you do this, you get to level up and stuff like that. It can be helpful to engage your audience, but it should be used sparingly where the reward should be actually what you achieve for doing it, not some just random prize. So it should be tied to the actual act that you're engaging in uh, or the learning goals that you have in mind. Um, does that, I think I saw a thumbs up at some point there. So hopefully that is answering the question that you were you're seeking to. So we talked a lot about, you know, the, 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 conceptual underpinnings of it, how we're framing games and our understanding of it, of play versus actually interactive design and simulation and learning and reflection, role-playing all be critical. Um, in terms of application and this, this way, Jeff, I'll bring you in as well. So it's not just heavy handed, uh, you know, just given the time, we don't have to go too deep, uh, Scott, into your field, but in terms of the application of game design, as I understand, or as we understand, you're working on this as it applies to um, in, uh, misinformation. Um, and disinformation studies. And, and Jeff, you have also have some live social systems aspects in, in your work. So maybe if the both of you could comment on the application of this perspective towards other fields of studies that you're pursuing uh, and why this mode of analyzing has been useful so far, what you hope to uncover, what, what you're interested in. Yeah, I will try my best to be simple and direct with kind of the work that I'm doing. So I mentioned before, the goal of the research that I'm doing is to look at disinformation through a lens of play. And that's specific in the sense that I 
kind of differentiated play in games earlier of like, how do we interact with it? Uh, and so the research that I do is broken into three kind of dimensions. Um, the latter dimension I think will be most pertinent to the group, but I'll ground everything else I'm doing. So the first thing I did is I spent time looking at alternative uh, social media communities in Canada. So alt left, alt right um, communities and how they are spreading disinformation within Canada. Um, I looked at that specifically thinking about how memes, entertainment, humor, so playful kind of artifacts are being used to increase participation and set the boundary lines of how we interact. So for example, you might have a community that posts a screw Trudeau meme. And so it's like meant to be funny and humorous, but by doing so they're reinforcing the idea that they don't like Justin Trudeau. Um, it's a very like simple example. And so I, I documented all that. And what I did with that is I turned that into a narrative adventure game where I looked at how kind of these networks are formed through the posts that they are making. Uh, the second thing that I did is I looked at existing educational tools. I looked at what kind of games have been made to talk about um, disinformation, fake news, all those things. And what are they doing well? What are they doing poorly? And I played now over 57 with 120 technically to go, but my supervisor told me I don't need to keep playing them because they are actually, surprisingly, almost all the same. There are three types of games being used right now. They are either narrative adventure games, which are just... And I mentioned before, there are those narrative games where your choices don't matter. A lot of them, your choices don't matter. However, to Jeff's point earlier, you do a lot of the time play as the villain. You're playing as the spreader of fake news, but you doesn't like the game doesn't give you choices in how you spread fake news. You just choose option A or option B, and then you spread it and you get points and you move on. Um, that or their quizzes. They're like, can you tell which news is real and which news is fake? And then you choose A and B. And so I've looked at kind of these structures and how they form. And the last thing that I'm doing is I'm taking these systems. I'm I'm taking these dynamics and I'm designing them into a game. Um, so if you were to Google me, not that you need to or anything like that, you would probably see a game called Lizards and Lies, which is a board game, which was a kind of proof of concept for how do we visualize the system that is disinformation flows. So how information moves between social media communities. And it kind of sits in um, simulation design stuff for those familiar with like Frasca. Um, it sits in um, wargaming studies. Um, and it sits in um, systems modeling where we're looking at how different actors, so you play as either a bad actor or a good actor, try to deal with the barrage of information online. And one of the core design pieces that I came across in that game was designing for feeling. And we talked a little bit about this with the role play stuff before, but one of the most powerful things you can do as like a physical game designer, an analog game designer, is you can design spaces for players to feel particular engagements. I think someone before in one of the comments, I saw like discussions of story. It's what narratives do really well. And it's also what disinformation does really well is it preys on emotions it preys on our interaction with content and so when i design these kind of games to talk with people about how these systems function one of the most important things i tried to do was create a feeling related to the roles that are there so for example in the board game i was just talking about one of the characters is a moderator on a platform which are typically the people who have to say yes or no to content that come across their feed they are the frontline defenders and what you see on most social media pages one of the biggest problems they're facing is burnout because surprisingly, even if you're seeing something really awful on social media, I bet you a hundred, hundred thousand dollars that they have seen something even worse than whatever you have seen on social media. And so a lot of them burn out and a lot of them have real, real tough mental health issues. And one of the core mechanics of the game is a feeling of being overwhelmed with how many like how many things you have to approve and deal with and so as you're playing the game you're like i don't know where to spend my resources i don't know where to spend my time everywhere seems to have a problem everywhere is being like worried in a flag uh and a lot of players have like talked about how like that feeling alone gives them a chance to reflect on why this information proliferates so quickly because the steps taken to determine if something's false are always longer than just to post false content. Um, so those are the kind of the core things that I'm doing. And I think by taking kind of a, like I, I do sometimes say that I do systems work, but I am in game studies because I'm designing them into game like tools, but taking those approaches where I'm breaking down these larger you know issues, I'm looking at various factors and I'm using systems thinking approaches in some capacity to break down who's all involved, not just the actors, but the larger kind of cultural, political, social dynamics that go into making these things as they are. Um, Yes, yeah, so that's like the, the overview and summary of what I do.
Very interesting. I think we'll have follow-up questions about that, but um, in terms of application, Jeff, Jeff, how, how about you? in your world in your research in your work the application of game design uh you know what what are you what are you seeing or working on oh uh, i i'm really gonna zone in on something that uh scott said which was about feeling and the ability to feel uh to almost like feel a system uh feel what feel the impacts of that i i started my career post strategic foresight innovation at ocad um, you know, in, in government and kind of asked to do strategic foresight, do trend reports, do scenarios and everything like that. And I realized very quickly, you know, we can do so many scenarios, we can do so much analysis, but so often it, it, it sits upon a shelf. Um, so how do you activate that work? And, uh, and and have people feel the the implications of 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 that that have, that have been um, illuminated through through that kind of analysis and research. So I you know I've been I've been doing um, games for energy and and I've been I'm trying to do games more games for in the, in the field of kind of ecological economics in general and thinking about big picture systems uh, dynamics but making it making it approachable. Um, the other piece, which again, drawing on what Scott said, there, there's a huge history of wargaming, and I use that as a as a major precedent for my work because, honestly, because it's uh, it's got uh, for a lot of people, it's got the pedigree that makes when you talk about we're going to use games for something very very serious, uh, it's it's got the 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 the, the luster for, for it. And, uh, and I went to go work with a, a group here in Toronto called Archipelago of Design for um, about six or seven months to help them um, with their gaming work. And, and, and basically they were using um, games like Scots in a, in, a, in a way to help officers in the military uh, think reflexively about, about uh, complex problems and, and be able to draw through, draw through uh, their training. So you know, overall, without getting into a huge amount of detail, I have used games in, in, in kind of a military context for a short time, but more broadly using the war gaming metaphor um, and, and, and a lot of the things we've talk, talked about today to help work through kind of complex systemic uh, problems um, in, in the sustainability energy energy space. And I think it's really exciting because, uh, you know, it's it's a tool for education. It's also a tool for a degree of analysis as well, and uh, and finding out the, the kind of questions that we that we, you know, I think most usefully the questions that we don't yet know are our questions. So so this maybe brings us to almost uh, addressing the question of this session itself. So I'm finally going to try to relate these two fields. And Scott, you kind of. Uh, hinted at this by saying that you know you refer to yourself in in a, in a game capacity, but really you you're you're operating in a systems thinking mode. And so, I like to position it as we talked a little bit about because of the nature of this group as systems thinking Ontario and our familiarity with system concepts. We talked a bit about relating systems thinking to game design and some of those concepts. But really, what in your both opinions, what are some of the takeaways that the field or the systems thinkers themselves can appreciate? that might not be visible from the outside in terms of game design and game studies. Um, any comments or reflection that you both have and then also open, happy to invite others into that question as well. Yeah, um, I can start, Jeff. Um, and so the fields are relatively interwoven depending on where you're looking, but there are obviously differences in, in what's being done. The most common difference that I, I would say I, I come across is that a lot of games are designed with a very, very specific goal in mind, and the goal is in terms of how people experience the game. Whereas a lot of time when we're doing systems design and systems thinking, we're more just trying, at least from my experience, we're trying to map out and create an understanding of what's going on here. And so when we're trying to make an understanding with a game, that goal of what we're trying to teach is typically already coded into the game. Whereas in the systems design space, that's not always the case because we're doing the systems design to figure out what we're trying to learn, right? Um, and so 
the the value that we can get from these two spaces that games get, can borrow a lot from systems design for thinking about how to scale and how to design because if you're making a game it's important to think about how these structures all come together but if you're if you're building from the system space it's important to think about the the interactive space that games are always thinking about when you when people are designing the game designers are thinking about typically two things they're thinking about how their players are going to play with the game and they're thinking about like what makes their game interesting and cool and engaging and i don't think the latter is less is, is is as pertinent to systems thinking because most of the time we're not doing systems thinking to be like cool no, no offense like we can be cool people but that's not like the it's not you know we're not trying to sell these on steam and make thousands of dollars um Whereas, but that, that piece of interaction is, is really, really important because I think considering how people come to the table and what you want them to get from that table is really, really important. I mentioned before that like games don't have to be perfect. Whereas a lot of the time in systems thinking, we want our system to be perfect, but we know that that's never possible because there's countless amount of um, variables that we would have to think about to put into it. And so one of the core design aspects is it's less about making it perfect it's about making it perfect for the player and the player's fantasy and so when i try to bring that from like a learning perspective i'm like it's the learner fantasy what do i want my learner to get out of this what do i want my learning points to be and what do i want them to understand at the end of the day jeff just mentioned in the previous kind of question that games are also research tools and when we're doing that i have it less on the player coming to the system and how they learn while engaging with the system, but how a player interacting with the system creates a conversation, which is actually very similar to how a lot of the future game stuff that I've engaged with engages in doing systems design future thinking, where they're like, let's create a system about the world five years from now, and what we have to do and the problems with it and solve it. And games do a very similar thing, but they focus on engagement where sometimes they don't perfect that that simulation, but that's okay because they know which parts to cut to still get to the conversation they want to get to. And so if I'm saying a takeaway from that is sometimes thinking about like, what is the actual scope of the systems that you're wanting to match out? And what aspects of that can we pare down as we start getting to the nitty gritty of what we're trying to research? Yeah, and I'd say um, just a preamble to this, but Scott lives in Montreal, is a Concordia. That seems to be a bit of a, a center for for serious games work, and and and, and in particular, you know, there's a there's a conference that's going to be going on. I think on February eighteenth or something like that. It's called Connections North. Um, I, I can maybe put the link in the chat after I finish speaking. But big kind of war gaming, serious gaming conference that is open to the public. That you know, if you're interested, people people I'll put the link in the chat after. But I, I say that to say one of those people uh, in 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 uh, Montreal as uh, Tom Fisher of Imaginetic. And I was listening to a podcast, a prominent game designer, serious game designer. And I was listening to a podcast. He said, the best way to understand something is to make a game about it. And I think that's something we have, we've kind of implied through a lot of this conversation, but it's like, when, the, the, it's, a, it's a great way of, of understanding uh, the scope of the, of the system dynamics of what, what, what are you trying to understand? What are you trying to say? You know, a game, uh, making a game is a great way to, to do this. And, and I just think, you know, being in, in Peter and David's class, a lot of the toolkits that we were using would be great game design toolkits uh, in a way of, 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 of breaking down what, what is it, what are, who are the actors in the system, what are their relations, how do they, how do they reinforce or, 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 or otherwise uh, each other. Um, it's it's a it's a really exciting field for for again building understanding trying to trying to under, trying to come to grips with uh, with the system. Yeah, that's incredible. I think like both of those aspects about the interaction part that Scott mentioned, but also both of you mentioned uh, the research aspect of it and that as a tool um, as well. So you could imagine Jeff uh, an OCAD OCAD SFI curriculum that incorporates game design as part of the systems course would be would be a wonderful kind of build uh, as this grows more acceptance for its legitimacy and, and its usefulness. Um, I want to open it up to the to any of the participants if there's any questions for both Scott and Jeff. I'm gonna I'm gonna break my uh, code or my my moderator tone and ask and ask a ask a question that's kind of just coming off the coming off the cuff. It was about um oh right. 
Um, maybe a little bit more towards Scott, but Jeff, you can apply this in. It's actually helpful if you don't know the background, but um, limits to growth was like a seminal piece in the 1970s and it, and it and it was based on system dynamics modeling of how much carrying capacity the earth has and what systemic changes need to be done and this was published in 1972 from work in 1968 peter jones oh peter's back on the call um, one of his like strong points of argumentation is that that model of that approach of modeling out in in a hard systems way the issues that are um you know, issues that are happening um, negate the value of a more contextualized approach that you have when you're interacting with people inside their own social systems and you're getting more appreciation for it. So there was two prospects on the table. The modeling one work uh, was favored and went forward. Um, and that was out of MIT, Jay Forrester, Danella Meadows, et cetera. And the other prospect didn't. And Peter carries on some of that work. And what occurred to me, Scott, and what you were describing was you were extremely cautious about not generalizing game design. And I feel that that is a high, that is a key point to highlight because from what I'm interpreting and what you're saying, you're trying to find the balance between the general application or the universality of games and interactions, but also the highly, highly, highly contextual relevance that that game impact has. And um, I guess I lost my question in my reflection. So it's not a question anymore. I was just reflecting perhaps on the resonance between social system design when it has to be hyper contextual and game design with Scott, your warnings that I actually hadn't had before. And maybe the question is, um, Scott, are there other game studies enthusiasts or scholars that are cognizant of that contextual variable. Yeah, I I mean, thank you for actually bringing some of that up because I, I actually was taking some notes because I'm going to look into some of Peter's work now, I think a little bit more um, if any, if I can find any of that. But um, yeah, I think the, the take that I have is actually not a lot of people, I, I get in debates with people a lot because people are like, oh, we're making a learning game. We should be able to reach as many audiences as possible. And it's fantastic. And if you look at the history of learning games, you actually see that like one of the big selling points is that they have a really long shelf life because like Oregon Trail was played in schools for, I mean, on it, I played it in like 20, 2000, like in the 2000s, that game came out in like the 70s or 80s, I think. And they have these, these really long persistent shelves lives because the concepts that we're trying to teach never go away. It's like the argument you always hear. And I think that's true for some concepts, right? Like we're always gonna need to teach people how to add and how to read. Like those are basic concepts that, you know, there are games that will always be effective for that. But when we're talking, and this is where I think a lot of education is going, where a lot of public discourse is going and where a lot of interest is, which is the social issue side, the, the cultural issue side, the political issue side, the, those large scale, challenges that we don't have obvious easy simple answers to it's not that two plus two equals four it's 700 different variable nodes or interacting with variables we might not even recognize and how do we as a citizen make sense of what's going on here and there i actually think context and subjectivity are critically important whether it's the subjectivity of myself coming to the table or as you know kelly kind of brought up earlier in terms of role play and empathy and what other subjectivities can i bring and perspectives can i see in what i'm playing and so um i actually find that there's weirdly like a lot of hype for the value and power of games and i i'm glad that there is but i want to make sure that people are refined to remember that like we can design games for general audiences, but the biggest challenge you have is that the game won't get taken up in the way that you meant it to get taken up. And I've actually had that in my own work. I, I mentioned Lizards and Lies before. I made that game freely accessible because it was a research project. It got government funding and it was like, so you, you're welcome to, if you Google it, you can find it, you can download it, you can play it. You can buy a copy because you know it's expensive to print. Um, but the point I bring up is that I designed that game as a research project being like, can we design this as a system that's playable? And how, what does that look like? The people that took it up were some teachers contacted me and were like, can I use this in my classes? And I'm like, cool, great, you totally can. I'll, I'll send you some facilitation guide notes. You can use them. And military groups. Um, which was like an unexpected audience. I wasn't aiming to have my media literacy game being used by military groups. And 
I was like, this is weird, but I'll talk with you and see what we can do. The game's free, so you can do whatever you want with it. Like, it's out of my hands. And there were some that were like, so now, if you actually look at the game, you'll see there's a Lithuanian version. It's being run in Lithuanian high schools because there was a military group that wanted to work with local schools on media literacy education there, which is great. And there were also some militaries that wanted to use it just for recruitment because it was hard to get in classrooms and media literacy is a hot button topic and they want to get in classrooms. And I had to be like, well, that's not the point. I didn't design this game as a recruitment tool. I designed this as a game so we can understand what's going on when we see something come across our newsfeed. But it was a really harsh reminder of like, I made this game with a particular audience in mind and I designed it for that audience. And when I facilitate it or others who are aware of the game facilitate with those audience, it, it works. However, when you make it open and others use it, all of a sudden it's taken up in ways that I did not intend and others didn't intend. And it's important to keep that in mind. And also if you are designing a game that, that that's out of your hands, right? It's out of my hands now. And the most I can do is offer the tools to those who come across it to make it as accessible as possible. But it's a, it's a, it is a big lesson that I've learned in the serious game space that I've engaged in. Yeah, that's a wonderful real life, uh, real experience example. Thank you for sharing that. So. Um, yeah, open to the participants. Any questions, reflections, ideas, insights, thoughts, relationships uh, from systems and game design that you want to ask Scott and Jeff in the last few minutes here? Uh, is that, um, I put a note in the chat about uh, finite and infinite games with respect to actually your comment about um, uh, the, how the limits to growth was a you know, conventional system dynamics modeling approach, which can be seen as a finite game approach. And it's, it's, it's not, it's not like a serious game, but uh, it's more as a linear um, mapped out, um, uh, you know, uh, scientific based um, game that actually has, you know, that has a particular purpose and use and doesn't have any room for interaction for modification or even reflexivity. An infinite game approach would be uh, what Hassan Ozbekan, the, the uh, alternative um, proposal at the Club of Rome was for stakeholder discovery, discovering stakeholder issues, um, articulating those in series, you know, dialogue, discourse and dialectic. Uh, and those are incompatible approaches uh, mm -hmm. with a, and so I, so I wonder with respect to, you know, Scott, your work, and with, uh, you, you might be familiar with James Cars and the Finite and Infinite Games. And this is, you know, of course, I think more, it's a completely different, you know, philosophical approach than, you know, game theory or zero sum games or, or in conventional uh, game mechanics. It's really perhaps, but it can be used in terms of you know, dynamics of a strategic uh, um, in strategic framing, such as you might have with information as well. That is, a finite game approach to information would be that there is, you know, in terms of disinformation, that there is that there is a single source of truth that can be known, even in a postmodern world. There is a known object of information that can be checked and approved by somebody, even if that isn't uh, all completely known. And then the responses to that would be um, could be measurably you know measurably wrong, and that would be a finite game approach. An infinite game approach would be that you can actually play with all epistemologies with respect to, especially news, because journalists today are actually very poorly trained and very poor. Very, you know, they don't have they don't have any funding to do investigations or to do deep research. I know how they were. I used to be with a long time ago. And these days they just take stuff off the wire, you know, and they and they just, add, you know, add a name to it. And so there are real, in terms of infinite game approach, there is quite a bit of possibility in what could emerge in, in any type of uh, agent simulation approach or in type of, you know, gaming through memes and the difference between information as an object and information as value, which is, you know, the intent to have a particular impact, which is probably the real problem with what's called disinformation is that there's a there's an effective attempt at persuasion, but all communication is about persuasion. So isn't this just some persuasion that somebody else doesn't like in terms of game, in terms of a game dynamic, or, or at least an infinite game 
uh, philosophy. So I just wonder, wonder to bring that up, not to like open that up, but just to say, in terms of either Zad's reference too, I think in systems theory, there's also nonlinear complexity, like infinite games, and structured modeling approaches, which are much more similar to finite games. I mean, it's a pretty big question. I'm not going to lie. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually a really important question. So I actually want to thank you because I it's one of those pieces that I am always hesitant to like, talk about is like the finite infinite because I find like people sometimes get confused in, in those dynamics. And thinking about information as an object versus a value is one of the things that I keep coming to terms with and how I look at the different spaces that engage. So like for me, when I talk about disinformation, which is a term that is racketed with different ways to to understand it to begin with the there are two ways that i can look at this uh when i'm talking about like the problem that we're at which is and you've laid it out nicely in the, in the finite infinite way which is the the user end or the production end so like the how the audience is engaged with it versus how it's produced um and i think that's where you have that difference between it being an object uh versus kind of being a value and i think it's more pertinent to sit in it on that conversation of value i actually talk to a lot of my students when i'm teaching media literacy about content doesn't really matter when we look at like foreign interference we don't like russia and china don't really care about the message they just care about the result of that message which is disruption if we're putting it very simply and so it comes to understanding that information is just a tool that's consistently being weaponized or renegotiated or reevaluated to people. And when I talk about disinformation and when I look at disinformation as playful, I talk about who is being played and who is playing. Um, which comes back to that conversation of audience and designer, right? So if I'm thinking about a post on social media, um, when it comes across your feed, um, if you choose to share it, you are now playing, if it's a disinformation piece that's been specifically designed by, a, you know, to get prop to get visibility, you are playing now in someone else's game. The game of perhaps uh, a political organization that's trying to build support, the game of a foreign actor that's trying to kind of infiltrate and in, engage in certain spaces, but you're participating in this kind of dynamic. And so when we talk about information in this perspective, it tries to tie into people's values, but it's actually just a tool that's consistently being used for particular means and gains and end games. And so I find the conversation on disinformation, if I'm being honest about the work that's being done, it's actually, to me, it's a bit stale right now where people keep telling me that disinformation exists, but the solutions and the results of that also frame it like it's a modern common issue if we look back in even canadian history to like the creation of like our own public broadcasting that came across concerns of like american propaganda and american influence on canadian spaces in like the 1920s and that's even arguably really recent if we look at the long history of propaganda and media manipulation um where these kind of brackets of how we engage with information are part of larger actions and systems that drive how they work and you know i feel like i keep using the word systems <laughs> tonight and perhaps that's a good or bad thing so i feel like i definitely just went off a tangent on what you were talking about but i i really think that conversation of value object finite infinite is one that i don't have a full answer to which is probably why i want a bit of a tangent but one that i think we need to talk about more because i think the the weeds of our concerns get lost and this is happening and not enough of like what do we do about it and i'm also, I'm going to be frank because it's 8.20 at night and I'm getting tired. We keep slapping a media literacy sticker onto it, and that's not a solution either. Um, there's there's a lot more to be done there, and I view that kind of conversation I mentioned before about having people think reflexively of what's going on, about what we're seeing and the frames we're engaging in, the systems we're engaging in. Those are the steps that actually get us to the answers of dealing with these problems. Yeah. Thank you. Um... Anyone else or anyone who hasn't spoken yet or anyone who, anyone else on the call have any reflections or thoughts for Jeff or Scott for, for the for the crew? Sure, Kelly, you can go ahead. It's you, did you, you, you caught that little, little thing. I was always gonna take it back. Uh, thank you very much for um, the topic. I think it's been really interesting and and uh, certainly there's more dialogue that that can that can come out of out of this space. 
I know that it's it's uh we have to wind up. So I'm holding on to other questions or or otherwise. Uh but I but I do I I appreciate uh you you bring the topic to uh to the group. Yeah. <clears throat> Happy to do so. Um David, what are we at? We're at 820. Do we do we is that a wrap or do we have what do you, do you have a few more minutes? Well, it's whatever you feel. Okay. I have oh sorry, Scott. Yeah, go ahead. Would it be I mean this might be ridiculous, but am I allowed to ask the exact opposite question that today was framed for, which is what can game studies contribute to systems thinking? But now hearing me talk, what can systems thinking contribute to game studies? I would love to I mean, I would say that most of you are more systems thinker experts than I am. And so I would love to kind of hear if people have, I mean, I feel like I've gotten some of it in the conversations we've had, but I think that might be an interesting conversation to hear some of those perspectives from based off what's happening uh, in the past few hours. Yeah, Dave, David, why don't you take that? Um, so I, I think that the discussion you've been having about um, uh, finite games and infinite games is actually uh, at the core of what we're uh, thinking about. Because when people think about um, games, they tend to think about the mechanics in the same way that we kind of have this feeling about hard systems and mathematical models. Um, and so one of the reasons I brought up the pluralistic games um, uh, idea was that that was about how is, how is we work better together? How is it we frame to collaborate and, uh, and move leadership forward? Uh, that's, that, that, that's their concern. So, um, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking of how we do that, uh, and uh, and since system thinking Ontario comes out of design with dialogue, we do that a lot with facilitation methods uh, when we have people in person. But then the question would be, how do you introduce technology into that uh, so that you get the interaction somewhat? Because people now with with the pandemic, people have now gotten used to being online, and it's very convenient to do this. Uh, but it's somehow not the same as playing games in person. So there's a kind of gap, and I think it's an opportunity there to explore. Yeah, I think I think that's a beautiful, succinct um, response. I, and, and I actually think there's a lot of adjacent fields. Um, one topic we didn't get to explore, I'll tease it, but let's just leave it unexplored, is, is, is exhibition design and art. And, and curatorial design, you know, you are designing for interactions, you are designing for reflexivity, where might that fit into this puzzle? And, and I guess I come at it from uh, less of a what, what can systems thinking in part, because I kind of see system thinking as just as a perspective. Um, but I do think there are so many adjacent fields where this is relevant as well. Maybe I'll yeah, Scott, go ahead. Here we go. Oh, just I think the overlaps are are quite pronounced. I mean, I, I much as I like to like, I feel familiar with a lot of the literature in like prepping for tonight. Knowing that the question was, I was like double checking. I was understanding my systems thinking versus game design versus cybernetics because like there's a lot of overlap, especially even the papers that are written and how people talk about these things where they just like throw the terms out synonymously, even though they're very much not. Uh, but I was like, okay, I got to double check everything. Um, and so I I think that's a, just a really great point that you you mentioned. I'm going to go one last question. It's a free, freebie one for Scott again, but it's it's a meta question. Maybe we can just close with this. Not meta, but it's actually kind of specific. In, in your study of like extreme social communities, have you noticed that in the media landscape we're in, people's view of it as a large game actually has now coined the term, like they use LARPing as an offense to call, to, to, to point out, uh, non-live action, you know, you know, people that are people that are non-live actors are kind of dismissing their point of view or dismissing it. And I thought that that was a poetic, ironic, self-reflective kind of phenomenon that's happening. And I just wondered, uh, is that an interesting observation of how that's matured to become enough, you know, to a, a critique, so so to speak? Yeah, I the the bleed of like game culture and game spaces into general dialogue and politics through the internet is actually a really like fascinating conversation especially when we look at alt communities i mean the histories are more academically written about from the alt right communities when we look at like 4chan and 8 coon and kind of their influence uh, 4chan for those unfamiliar is like reddit but 
even less moderated uh, and protected. Uh, so it's a social media space where pretty much anything goes. And like, there's been entire movements against, um, like Gamergate was a big one in 2016, give or take, where um, uh, academics and journalists of color and uh, typically female gender were attacked um, via like dedoxing and like SWAT teams sent to their houses because they perceived that, uh, because there were conversations about um, left ideology in games. And that's, again, that was a gamer specific thing, but since that, and even before then, and with streamer culture on the rise and political stream culture on the rise, we see a lot of game language being brought into how people talk about politics and how they talk about their daily lives, which is fascinating to think about um, as like, we talk I mean, we know that like culture shapes how we see the world around us but i don't think it was like people's first perspective when they thought about social media and digital games as how much they would bleed into political discourse but i mean even in the work that i've done and in my personal life where like i play i mean let's be real i play games i'm wearing the headset and everything um like i'll be on like servers with people and all of a sudden they'll drop like a, a survey for me to like sorry a petition for me to sign against like a government mandate in the like in the middle of like playing like a, an rpg with people and so it's like the bleed between these systems is fascinating and the language being used is fascinating i mean the freedom convoy to me is one of the best examples for talking about the playfulness that comes along this where like and i'm not going to get into the politics of the freedom convoy but there were hockey games being played on the streets of Ottawa. There were bouncy castles on the streets of Ottawa. And there were also other, um, you know, statue defacements happening all at the same time where you're seeing kind of that convergence of misleading kind of ideologies, which some, some were and some weren't, depending on which audiences you're looking at in the convoy, converting with actual play structures of like sports and bouncy castles with like minion cartoons. And I think like, the bleed between play and games, even though we always view them as leisure objects, they're not always that case. Like where we we view them as like leisure and fun. And I think that's why sometimes game studies struggles to find validation in certain disciplines. Like people will shrug them off because they're just looking at games. Um, I don't know if systems thinking has that. You guys always seem like you're very like, oh, they're systems thinkers. They they know what's going on. But in game studies, like, oh, they're just playing games. They don't know what's going on. And it's it's weird because the, the parallels are so similar. Um and now I went on a slight, slight rant there, but um, the point that I'm trying to make is that they're much more serious and part of everyday life than we would think. And I think you see that sometimes in language, but if we also look closely at kind of the movements and actions and interactions, we also see it in that as well. I think that's a, a healthy, almost concluding point to land on, which is that um, game thinking and game perspectives are more permeating in our world than we might realize and and they are there so perhaps there's a reframe in our own lives about you know really appreciating that i, I guess what solomon said earlier in the discussion about the re the reality of our lives as game and our reality as a game so um thank you scott thank you jeff um and thank you everyone for joining today so that was that was a session on what can systems thinkers learn from educational game game studies. And I hope we all had some takeaways. I thought that was a wonderful session. Um, the next session is not yet is scheduled for February 12th. So that would be the second Monday of the month. We don't yet have the exact agenda or, or speaker lined up just yet. But um, if you um, keep posted on the Google groups um, for System Thinking Ontario and the website, we'll post it there as soon as that's ready. Um, but I just wanted to, once again, thank everyone for joining tonight. Thank you for taking the time out. And um, thank you, Scott and Jeff, for engaging in such a rich conversation. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to hear your thoughts and get to talk about some of the things that I love. And Jeff, it's always a pleasure to chat with you and hear, hear what you're doing. It's fantastic. Likewise, Scott. And thanks, everybody, for just great, uh, great dialogue tonight. It was, it was really a joy. Thank you. Awesome. And we have the recording and for anyone, you know, we'll, we'll be posting that. Um, you can get in touch with us shortly. Uh, it'll be in the queue as David says. Okay. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you again. Take care. Good night. Thank you.